I'm going to move now to Bayesian updating. This is a, uh, a particularly important subject, and it's one where this material I'm going to show you is, is completely new. Um, it has not been published yet, and, and we don't really have any uh, full range of use cases or anything like that. Uh, yet, so I'm going to. The, the title of it is Metal Log Regression and Bayesian Inference. I'm in the process. If I, if I actually weren't giving this uh, session today, which by the way I'm very much enjoying, um, I would be working on finishing off. I, I've got a paper on this. It's co-authored with my thesis advisor Ron Howard. We're going to submit it for publication um, and go through the full peer review process and whatnot. Um, the general topic is converting an any shape prior in light of new data into an any shape posterior in closed form according to Bayes' theorem. Uh, this has never been possible uh, in the way that I'm going to show it, and again, it, it is now. Um, there, there is, as you can see here, uh, you know, most of my stuff I just give away, as, as I <laughs> have been doing freely in these uh, in these workshops. Uh, this particular result, at least in my own mind as author at, at the moment, is so significant. Having said that, I do very much want to do beta tests of it, uh, and I'd be delighted to proceed with Lockheed Martin in some way in doing those. So this is the kind of stuff that, that could or should be used, hopefully forever. So what do I mean by this? Well, ever since I was a graduate student, I've always wanted to do Bayesian inference in closed form, and I've never been able to. Uh, and specifically, what we're talking about is if you're starting off with a prior probability distribution, such as what you see on the left, uh, which has a cumulative distribution and a density function, and your variable interest uh, come up at, let's, let's say that's the length of a trout. It's the next trout you're going to catch, and there's a 10% chance that it will be less than 10 inches. The median is 14 inches, and the, uh, the 90 percentile is, uh, let's say, 18 inches. That's your prior probability distribution. And then you go out and gather some empirical data. And the data shows you that you know, your first trout is 16, and then 10, and then 24. That's a really big one. 20 inches, and then 17. Now you've got this empirical data. Well, the question is, how can you combine that data with your prior probability distribution in a way that's consistent with Bayes' theorem, so that you would end up with a cumulative, with a, a posterior distribution over your variable of interest, such as this blue one shown, and here's the prior. But the posterior distribution, what it does, naturally, is it takes this new data into account. The prior distribution, you only had whatever your prior data was. If any, it could have been a matter of expert opinion, for that matter. But now that you have real-world data, you'd like to be able to somehow incorporate that data and the information in your prior distribution to get a posterior distribution, which in this case would shift somewhat to the right because these fish, at, particularly at 16, 24, 20, 17, even though there was one small one, these fish are indicating, the ones that were actually caught are indicating that the, the river you're fishing may have bigger fish in it than, um, uh, than what would have been your prior expectations. So that's what we're trying to do. That's the holy grail that I've always wanted to do. Uh, it's never been possible, and suddenly it became possible with the metalogs in a way that I just began to realize about 18 months ago. I am going to capitalize on this example. Uh, for me, it just happens to be one that is uh, that, that's easy to think about. Uh, and it's, it's, it's actually a topic I know a lot about. Uh, the Williamson River is right behind me in this uh, in this uh, video that you see when you're looking at at, uh, at the video of me. That's the Williamson River right there. I live here, um, and you can see that there's a big difference between a typical Williamson River trout and a typical trout from Montana. And most people don't know that. Particularly people in Montana have no idea. Most catch and release trout fishermen have no idea that the Williamson River typically produces bigger trout than the famous uh, Montana rivers. The, uh, f to a fly fisherman, uh, size matters. <laughs> and I say that tongue in cheek, but it does. Uh, bigger trout are more wily. They're more difficult to catch. They typically tend to be smarter. They're harder to catch. They're more particular. And they're just more, inter more interesting uh, by way of challenge. Um, 
the one you see on the right there in front of uh, where I live here, that's, pr that's about 25 inches, probably weighs six or seven pounds. The one on the left from the Big Hole River, that was uh, it's big enough that somebody thought by Montana standards that should be published. That's probably 18 inches, maybe a pound and a half or two. So there's a big difference here, but most people don't know that. My, uh, I've named my fly fisherman here Norman. He's an ex experienced catch and release Montana fly fisherman. I've named him after Norman McLean, and I don't know how many of you saw the, river, the Robert Redford movie, A River Runs Through It, but uh, Norman McLean is the author of the novel, A River Runs Through It. And that, uh, that movie and that novel uh, influenced fly fishing and, and, and for, for that matter, appropriate conservation for the better. Uh, many people started paying attention who were not paying attention before. Anyway, Norman's going to come to the Williamson River. He's never been here before. He knows nothing about the Williamson River, knows nothing about fishing in Oregon. He's just going to plan to try it. He does not know that the Williamson River typically produces larger trout uh, than the famous Montana rivers. And the question is, how should he update his prior probability distribution over the size of his next Williamson trout based on the size of uh, each trout he catches? The presumption here is that since he doesn't know anything about the Williamson, his prior distribution would be based on his experience of the length of all the Montana trout he's caught, which might be many hundreds or even thousands in his lifetime. Uh, and, and he's going to learn as he experiences the Williamson that his prior distribution probably needs to be updated uh, based on what happens. So. I'm going to show you now. This this is in a sense in a sense I'm giving you the punchline before giving you everything in between, which is a considerable amount, and includes uh, some detailed mathematics, uh, which I'm going to give at least in an overview sense. But the key topic here is how do you start with a prior, and let's just say behind the scenes it's not no, known, but it's not known by Norman. But let's say your prior distribution has 10, 50, 90 quantiles, 10, 13, 18 inches. But when he actually comes fishing on the Williamson, what he's actually doing is sampling from a distribution, which is more like 10% uh, chance of being less than 14 inches, 50% chance of being less than 18, and 90% chance of being less than 24. So the fish on average are bigger than all, not all bigger, but it's it's a very fair thing to say in the Williamson that half the fish are half the fish you catch are over 18 inches, which would be like a one chance in 10 for many uh, of the Montana rivers. So that's the source distribution plotted here for illustration. Then what happens? Well, Norman catches his first fish on the Williamson now, and and let's just say that fish is 15 inches. Well. How does he think about that, or how would one think about that? Well, there, there are two different ways of thinking about it. One might be, if, if you're Norman, well, I just caught one fish, and, and it's bigger than what I expected, but so what? I, I might always catch, you know, <laughs> given one sample, I could always catch a bigger fish than what I expected, right? The, the other way he could look at it is he could say, hmm, I wonder if this is indicative that the Williamson Rigger river has bigger fish in it than uh, what are my typical Montana experience. And those, those are the things, those are the two points of view that basically needed to be traded off whenever one does Bayesian inference. As you can see in this case, just adding one more fish doesn't really change your posterior distribution very much relative to the prior. But on the other hand, if, for example, if he, you know, after he caught his second fish, which in this case is 10 inches, well, that's a particularly small one, and now he may be back to a posterior distribution that's almost exactly the same as the prior. But now, after six fish, let's say his his fish number three through six are 24 inches, 18, 18, and 17. Well, now that's becoming substantive information that says, gee, the fish in this river may be bigger than what I'm uh, used to on my, uh, Mon uh, the rivers of my Montana experience. And then finally, the posterior after 100 fish begins to converge, not surprisingly, given these fish are randomly sampled from the Williamson, the posterior begins to converge to the source distribution. And the quantile parameters, which are now 13.1, 17.7, 24.4, are beginning to converge. In fact, they're rapidly converging to the quantile parameters of the Williamson River source distribution.
So what we're looking for is a system that can be updated in closed form according to Bayes' theorem that has these kinds of characteristics. Well, where does that come from? Let's, uh, let's go back a little bit and look at this into the, uh, the history of probability. Uh, and we've talked about this before, where in the 1700s, both Bayes' theorem and the normal distribution were both published right around the same time. And they couldn't be more different in the sense that the normal distribution led to a, a, a long set of assumptions about shape-constrained distributions and the whole theory of classical statistics Bayes' theorem laid, laid the foundation for probabilities can be of any shape at all. Uh, and those are very different. And we, the, the, the Pearson distributions for a long time have been the gold standard for flexible distributions. That was uh, invented more than a century ago. Turns out the Metalog distributions uh, are far more flexible than the Pearson distributions. And for the first time, are, 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 are a you know, a family of distributions, there could be others in the future, but they're the first of a family of distributions that can literally represent continuous probabilities of any shape. And so that's, the, in a sense, the breakthrough that the metalogs bring. They're equally uh, uh, applicable in classical statistics applications. But what does all that have to do with Bayesian inference? Well, when you get into Bayesian inference, there are a couple of other major things that have happened, uh, the most important of which was the pu pu publication of Rafe and Schlafer in 1961 called Applied uh, Statistical Decision Theory. And why is that in publication important? Well, the Bayesian updating, by its nature, requires doing a set of calculations according to Bayes' theorem that most often cannot be done in closed form. They're a little bit like the sums of identically distributed log normals. There's no closed form way to, to update in general uh, probability distributions, general probability distributions according to Bayes' theorem in closed form. Rafe and Schlafer came up with the idea of a conjugate prior and published that in their very famous book. Conjugate prior is a set of uh, families of probability distributions which in the face of new data can be updated in closed form and that's why this is a very, very powerful uh, result. In the meantime, more and more people became persuaded that Bayes' rule is the way to do things. It turns out, at least in my view, Bayes', were, Bayes rule is nothing more than an extension of logic. And you know, when you're doing any analysis, it's better, presumably, to be logical than illogical. If, if your new analysis said 2 plus 2 equals something, and you concluded that it equals 5, well, that would be illogical. You wouldn't want to do that. And in the same way, you wouldn't want to update a probability distribution in light of new data in a way that is not consistent with Bayes' theorem. But that's been a matter of controversy because for centuries, the classical statisticians only wanted to deal with things that were objective in the sense of there's data and they didn't want to have these subjective priors. Uh, but in the meantime, other people, Bayesians, said, you know, but you can't ignore the prior information and you shouldn't. And then finally, in 2011, uh, there's a beautiful book published, The Theory That Would Not Die, and I don't know how many of you read it, but it's how Bayes rule cracked the Enigma code, hunted down Russian submarines, emerged triumphant after two centuries. <sighs> oh, sorry, I get a little emotional here. Um, uh, I'll, I'll tell a brief story. Uh, Bayes' rule did help crack the Enigma code, um, and, 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 and that's what led to the uh, cracking of the German code in World War II. Uh, Alan Turing was working on that at Bleshley Park in England, and, uh, and my mom was working uh, under the Pentagon with the U.S. team that eventually accomplished and did the same thing. So anyway, my mom was part of breaking the Enigma code, and it was important in our family. Now, having said this, I'd recommend the book, but this book, this is a 2011 book, but smart people eventually became persuaded that Bayes' rule was the way to do things, and now we wouldn't want to do things without using Bayes', Bayes rule. 
But it turns out to be be extremely complicated, so complicated that a lot of Markov chain Monte Carlo and other computationally intensive methods uh, are typically used. And uh, I'm going to show a way through this that won't uh, that won't supplant all of those, but may supplant a significant portion. Now, uh, and that's what metalog Bayesian inference is. Uh, Keelan and Howard, this is a paper that will be forthcoming. Uh, we have we haven't done it yet. Here is here is a quote from the um, uh, from Rafe and Schlafer, and this is actually a Xerox of of, of their introduction on uh, conjugate priors. Uh, they said their desirable distributions, the F should be analytically tractable. Certainly, metalogs are. F should be rich so that there be a member of these distributions capable of expressing decision maker prior beliefs. F should be parameterizable in a, in a manner that can be readily interpreted, etc. Metalogs are dominantly superior to other distribution families. Uh, if Rafe and Schlafer had had, would have had these in 1961, they would have done wonderful things with them. But now these were not invented until 50 years later, so the distributions they had uh, were the best they could do anything with. And, and they're good ones, and we're going to use some of them. Now, next important uh, ch chapter in this story is the linear model. And this is multiple linear regression. This is not uh, new to me, and it's probably not new to you. Uh, we use linear regression all the time. And the basic assumption underlying linear regression, whether it's, uh, you know, have, ha whether it has one dependent variable or many dependent variables and a single independent variable over here, is uh, that there is a normally distributed uh, error term. And you've got, you basically you have some kind of a linear model which is uh, uh, basically a matrix which depends on a set of basis functions multiplied by, it's a linear function of a set of coefficients beta plus an error term. And this is what underlies, every time you do a linear regression, this is what underlies it. Um, a lot of people have said things like, you know, this is a quote from a paper from 1970s in the literature, we focus on multiple linear regression, it's widely used, highly dimensional parameter space. It's very, very uh, important because many things are available in closed form under this model. It's relatively simple to calculate. And from the standpoint of Bayes' theorem, if these errors are assumed to be uh, normally distributed with mean zero and a known or unknown uh, variance, a sigma squared, then the corresponding likelihood function is the quadratic sum of squared errors. And I've listed that here. Now, as is well known, the, the beta hat, that is the estimate for these unknown parameters beta, which are being inferred from the data x and y, uh, that beta hat, the beta hat that maximizes this likelihood function is this familiar ordinary least squares equation. And so this is the, the, the widely accepted and most widely used unbiased and best estimate of the regression coefficients given the data. I'm not saying anything new here, but it is important background for what I will be about to say. So it basically, every time you are doing a linear regression, if you're assuming that your regression coefficients that are estimated by least squares uh, represent something meaningful, then you're assuming basically this, uh, this re these normally distributed error terms, and then you've got the, uh, the best estimate here. This, this model is brilliant in its robustness, elegance, simplicity, and richness. And it, it lacks by excluding all prior knowledge. It's not a Bayesian model at all. It's a, uh, it's a classical statistics model where the beta hat is determined only by the data, and there is no role or room for prior distributions in it. Well, that's all, that's all fine and good. But what if the beta coefficients are uncertain? Many people have tried to address that, including the authors of this paper. And the, uh, and, and the way that that has been addressed has been uh, in terms of conjugate priors. And this, it, there's an excellent overview on this uh, called ba Bayesian linear regression that's in Wikipedia. It's also in every statistics textbook, or presumably almost every one. But the key, the key to it is that if you assume, and this is a big assumption, that there's a multivariate normal distribution 
over these regression coefficients. You're uncertain about what they are. You're going to try to infer them from data. It, um, if you're uncertain about what they are, and mo but model them as a multivariate normal distribution, and if you're uncertain about the sigma squared, that is the measurement error, and you model that with an inverse gamma distribution, and by the way, that is a, it looks like a lot like a nor log normal distribution and is parameterized by a couple of hyperparameters, A0, B0. If you do that, then in the light of new data, you can come up with a multivariate normal distribution, inverse gamma distribution in closed form as a function of that data uh, that uh, has the same functional form as the priors you started off with. This is the conjugate prior that, uh, that Rafe and Schlafer uh, came up with. And furthermore, if you want to look at the marginal distributions, if this sigma squared is uncertain, it turns out that the marginals are student t distributions. Um, and the marginal distributions over the betas are also student t distributions. And most importantly, all of these updated uh, parameters, mu and lambda, are calculated in closed form according to this set of equations, which depends only on the prior information, a0, b0, lambda0, uh, mu0, and the data. So this is Bayesian updating in closed form. And uh, th this is, you know, all these shapes are very reasonable for their purpose. Lightning fast, robust uh, parameter updating in closed form. And Jane's is applauding. Who's Jane's? Well, Jane's is a person that would have well applauded this result in 1961. Uh, Jane's was a professor of physics at the Washington University in St. Louis that wrote some of the most persuasive papers on the nature of Bayesian updating and the fact that, Bayesian, that, that the Bayesian view of the world, the probabilities are a state of information rather than a state of nature. Uh, writing those papers persuaded many people, including my thesis advisor, Ron Howard, that Bayesianism was in fact the way to go and the classical statistics approach, classical statistics approach was inherently lacking. He did this based on physical, real world physics interpretations that are, uh, are difficult to argue against. In fact, my thesis advisor, Ron Howard, tells the story that he was given his first paper that was written by Jaynes in about 1966 or so, after he had just begun inventing decision analysis. And his, he, what he said was he went into the barbershop where he was getting a haircut. He went into the barbershop not quite knowing how to think about Bayesianism versus classical statistics. And when he came out of the barbershop, he came out as a Bayesian. If you haven't read of any, any of Jane's papers um, and you're interested in such things, I highly recommend them. However, the Bayesian model has been extremely difficult to use in practice. Ever since it was invented in the 1960s, people have thought this is the solution. And I think a lot of professors uh, at the day when I began going to college in the 60s and 70s a lot of people thought that this Bayesian thing has been solved because we, now we can do it in closed form. But what they hadn't really realized is that there's certain things about it that are very, very difficult to solve. For example, this, this mu zero parameter of the multivariate normal distribution over the coefficients, well, how do, you, how do you assess that? That's the prior over regression coefficients, and regression coefficients are inherently not interpretable. What, what, you know, how do you even think about that prior? And even worse than that, you have to assess a prior covariance matrix on the coefficients. And if you can't even interpret the coefficients themselves, how are you going to interpret a covariance matrix? People have tried. They've written papers on it. But there's never been anything that's satisfactory. And so you cannot, in a, in a, you, while, the, while the mathematics works, you can't interpret it. And so it's, it's just fallen into a lot of uh, pretty much disuse, the Bayesian linear model. And maybe there are still some uses of it that I'm not aware of, but it hasn't, it hasn't, it hasn't achieved what should have been its wise, widespread appeal for these reasons. I'm going to focus right now on the uh, mu and uh, lambda and sigma squared, uh, and we can come back to A0 and B0 in another session. These are, these are pretty minor extensions that get, get you to the student T. But let's talk about what kinds of solutions can we offer. Well, the first, uh, the first thing we can offer in terms of metalogs 
is, is quantile interpretation. That is, we can interpret the coefficients, beta, the regression coefficients, as quantiles, which are highly interpretable. And I'll explain that in a second. So that solves that problem. Secondly, the covariance matrix, sigma squared, where sigma is the error, the error uh, measurement uh, uh, standard deviation, and lambda zero is this, is this matrix that's difficult to assess. But that covariance matrix, it turns out to be a function only of the number of data with the way I'm going to formulate the problem here. And thus, you don't even have to assess it or otherwise determine it. It comes out automatically, which, which is a marvelous feature and enables this whole system that I'm going to present here for Bayesian inference to be a relatively simple, closed form, and interpretable. So. First observation here, if you haven't noticed it already, the metalog is a linear model. I mean, we never thought of this when we originally developed the metalog, but it is a linear model. Look, here's the metalog equation. It exactly fits the definition of a linear model. It exactly fits the, the definition of a linear model used throughout statistics, throughout linear regression, and so forth, as I just explained. But we have to interpret it differently. We have to interpret this as observations of the variable of interest, like fish length. The, the explanatory variables here are a multiple basis functions that are a function of, interestingly enough, how extreme is the fish you caught compared to your prior data, the newest, newest one you caught compared to your prior data. These are the explanatory variables. And here are the coefficients that you're trying to, uh, that you're trying to estimate and update as a result of the data. And the notation of this is simply x equals y beta in a matrix format. And uh, so we've met the definition of a linear model. And let's give the example. Now let's show how the coefficients are a linear function of the quantile parameters and vice versa. Well, sp suppose you have a prior distribution where the quantile parameters are 0.1 chance of 40, 0.5 chance of being less than 50. 0.9 chance of being less than 70. And you've got this three-term metalog distribution. This works for any number of terms, by the way. I'm just using three terms as an example. Well, the quantile parameters, these, these Q values, which are the 40, 50, and 70, well, they have a linear relationship with the beta parameters. And as a result of that, you can show, it's just quite simple, so long as this Y matrix is invertible. I'm going to call this YR. This is your reference probability R. You could pick 10, 50, 90. You could pick 5, 50, 95, whatever you wanted. This is your reference probability vector. Your Y matrix depends only on that. And your beta co, if you know what Q is, you know your beta coefficients. So in this case, 40, 50, 70, your beta coefficients are 50, 6.83 and 5.69. Now these things, 6.83, 5.69, are, are not interpretable. The 50 turns out to be the median, but those are not interpretable. Those are a mess. So, so we can we can interpret the beta coefficients in terms of the reference probability vector and uh, and the quantile parameters. And inversely, if you have the beta coefficients, you can interpret those as quantile parameters simply, directly, and in closed form. And nothing could be easier to interpret than these. What does that enable us to do? Well, here I've got a prior multivariate normal distribution over a set of regression coefficients. In fact, it's the same set of regression coefficients that I just showed you. And this, you know, the, the, uh, Anyway, the, 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 the prior and posterior distributions over, let's say, uh, B1, that's, that might be interpretable, it might not be. That's your intercept. But B2 and B3, why is this one narrow? What does it mean? Where is it located? Same thing with B3. You have no way of having interpretable units. But in terms of the metalog world, you do have nice, smooth, interpretable units. And these are the marginal distributions of the multivariate normal distribution. And look how you can see a nice smooth over, let's say, uh, 10, 13, and 18 are your quantile parameters. There are your posterior distributions that get updated. How do we do this? Well, look at the multivariate normal distribution, which is uh, where beta is distributed multivariate normal. 
There's a theorem that many of you may be familiar with that says a linear transformation, including a matrix transformation, of a multivariate normal variable is multivariate normal distributed. Therefore, given that we have a linear relationship between Q and beta, then we know that the distribution over Q is also multivariate normal, where the mean of that, the quantile mean, is just YR, your matrix on the reference probability vector times mu, and then you multiply this lambda by YR and post multiply it by YR. Anyway, this is this is basically the uh, uh, the uh, the relationship, I didn't invent this, this has been long known in statistics, but it, it just allows us to instantly convert a multivariate normal distribution over here into one that is interpretable, and that is gives us a huge, huge advantage in terms of being able to use the Bayesian linear model. And furthermore, if I had this distribution, I can convert it back in this direction in order to use the Bayesian updating equations for the coefficients. So. Basically, what I've said, this is the same uh, linear model, Bayesian linear model equation that I showed you previously. Uh, these are the updating equations. And what I've basically done with the metalog quantile parameters and, and the reference probability matrix is I've said you can start off with a distribution like this over a variable of interest, like your uh, length of the next fish you're going to catch. You can model the quantile parameters of this distribution as multivariate normal put them into here, and update the beta coefficients in this way, and out the other end, you will get a set of quantile parameters that are multivariate normal, now updated, and you can there, therefore calculate your probability distribution over the length of the next fish you catch based on the updated data. So the key assumptions of metalog Bayesian inference are as follows. The prior and posterior distribution of the variable of interest are metalogs. Now, actually, it's broader than this. They can be any quantile parameterized distribution, according to my 2011 paper. Uh, I've used the metalogs because these are the most advanced of the quantile parameterized distributions. They're the most known about the, they're the most, they're best known and most flexible, and so we might as well use the metalogs. Uh, the the first there are three assumptions here. One is quantile parameters are the mean. A Q bar of a multivariate normal distribution over a normal or student T distribution, which models their uncertainty for updating purposes. So here is the key diagram of this. Whatever your quantile parameters you've come up with, Norman's quantile parameters are 10, 13, and 18 for the, you know, based on his Montana, Montana experience for the size of the first trout he'll catch on the Williamson. But he's uncertain about that. As he as he catches fish on the Williamson, he may very well end up learning that fish on the Williamson are smaller. Maybe these things will all move to the left. Maybe they will all move to the right. He doesn't know. He doesn't know which way they, they will move. And furthermore, it's not unreasonable for him to believe, probably, that, that it's equally likely that it will be higher or lower, the actual quantile parameters, than his initial estimates. Um, furthermore, uh, probably more is known about the median than there are about the extreme values, and that's why these distributions up here on the extreme values are a little bit wider than these in the center. Uh, but all this can be done with the multivariate normal quite easily, and so at least at first cut it seems a pretty reasonable way uh, uh, to represent uncertainty over the quantile parameters. So the mean here is, is, uh, is, is controlled by uh, your previous estimates in terms of quantile parameters, your prior, whatever that is. And the width of these distributions is controlled by that lambda matrix, that lambda covariance matrix, which I'll show in a minute uh, where that comes from. That depends on two things. It depends on assuming that the model measurement error is uncertain per the linear model, and also relevant information can be expressed in terms of prior data. And this, these are new, or no, the, this third one is new, the second one is not new. And I'll give the example. Uh, I don't know how many of you have ever tried to measure the length of a wild, live, slippery trout. Uh, but that's not easy for us catch and release fly fishermen. And the trout uh, would rather get back into the river and proceed with its life than be measured. And so any normal attempts to measure it are subject to measurement error. Uh, the way we do it in practice is we use what's called a measure net. <coughs> 
And when the trout is lying in the bottom of the net, which it's willing to do at least for a moment usually, uh, before it starts flapping around again, you can see that there's a zero at the bottom of the net, and it's measured in one-inch intervals. And you can see this trout is probably about 17 inches long, 12 or 19 inches long, 12 on one end, seven on the other. But but inherently that is subject to measurement error. You just can't do it exactly in a practical way. And so we'll just adopt the error structure widely assumed for ordinary linear regression, which is that error is normally distributed with a standard deviation of sigma squared. In this case, th this sigma squared could be uncertain, and that's what leads you to the student t formulation. For simplicity in this discussion, I'm just going to use sigma squared. Let's just say for now, measurement error is likely to be about plus or minus one inch. And let's say my uh, sigma squared is roughly one. That's probably a reasonable, uh, uh, reasonable for discussion now. And we can use it for sensitivity analysis, and that means the whole system really Re, re, um, comes down to updating the multivariate normal. But as I say, we can make this sigma uh, uncertain and model it uh, very directly using, uh, uh, we, with very direct extensions uh, in, a, in a more uh, detailed conversation later time. Now let's go to the third assumption. And this is a really critical one that took a long time before I finally realized what, what needed to be done here. But I'm defining a concept that I haven't seen in the literature. Maybe it's there someplace. I'm not an expert in all the literature. But I'm defining a concept called a data prior. A data prior is a state of information that consists of prior data, which is a number of prior data, n0, uh, and the belief that no other information is relevant to updating with new data. So. Uh, what what could a, what could a data prior be? Well, a data prior could be, for example, empirical data from Norman. Let's say Norman has a Montana journal and he's recorded hundreds of trout observations in his Mon Montana journal over his lifetime, and he knows that his 10, 10, 50, 90 of of 10, 13, and 18 inches are consistent with all the data he's recorded in that journal. Well, that could be an empirical data prior. We could fit a metalog to that. We could run and, and we could determine from it the 10, 50, 90 quantiles. And Norman would likely, likely to agree, would likely agree that this prior uh, CDF here is a good representation of his, uh, of his prior information. He doesn't need any other information to represent his prior information because we've represented his data prior quite reasonably. Well, that's an, that's, that's an example of a data prior. He's assuming that there's no prior prior to that, uh, just uh, that his prior information can be expressed in terms of data. However, it often happens that you, you may have all this prior data, but things have changed. For example, uh, you know, David Jackson has said several times that you know, your reliability of parts changes over time. As the newer parts and the newer systems for manufacturing those parts come into play, these parts may very well be less likely to fail than the older parts that were manufactured by older methods. So you may have all of this, let's say it's uh, time to failure information, you may have all of this uh, previous data, but you wouldn't want to use, let's say you had 200 previous data points, you wouldn't want to use those 200 points as your prior because you'd say, well, those aren't that relevant to the new information, which is that parts are being manufactured by more modern methods. So we can assess this N0. This N0 is a critical measure of the strength of your prior relative to new information. In Norman's case, it would be question, how many Williamson trout would be equally informative as your prior experience? Well, Norman coming to the Williamson knows that he's on a new ecosystem. He knows he's on a new river. Even if he has thousands of trout in his Montana database, he knows that the first or second or third, by the time he's caught 10 trout on the Williamson, he would say that actually, would actually be more informative than my entire prior experience in Montana. Even though this represents my prior experience, 10 Williamson trout would be more informative, six would be about equal, uh, three would be less informative. If I only caught three trout on the Williamson, actually my prior Montana experience is more informative, six would be about equal. That's an assessment of N0. And if we do that assessment, we have what's called an encoded data prior. Uh, 
and encoded data prior in this sense, you use the shape and location information from your previously assessed prior or your encoded data prior. But you're basically saying the new information deserves a heavier weighting than all the data in this case in your, uh, that your, your, uh, your prior might have been determined from. That becomes your encoded data prior. Well, once you have that, now you can begin to do Bayesian updating in closed form according to the assumptions I've made. And this data prior and the new data are the only things that are required for Metalog Bayesian inference. And let me show a little bit how that works. One of the astonishing findings here, and this is, again, this is a new theorem. It'll be published in, in uh, Ron Howard's and my paper. But if you start off over here with, let's say, some set of data as, as your data prior, let's say 10, 11, 12, and 18 inches. Let's suppose those are your prior data according to some data prior. And then you get new data, 13 and 17 inches. Okay. Well, the updating equations that I showed you previously, if you assume uh, an, a, a diffuse prior prior, if you assume a data prior, that makes this lambda 0, 0. Um, if you make that assumption, then you can apply these updating equations. And this is just a matter of matrix multiplications. You can apply these updating equations to get lambda n and mu n. Lambda n they term, determines your covariance matrix. And you just go through and you calculate your y0, your y nu, your lambda 0, your lambda nu, your lambda n, blah, blah. Boop. And you convert that back. And there are your updated quantile parameters based on having updated this, prior, this data prior with this new information. So that is simply using the equations of the Bayesian linear model uh, and the assumption of a data prior. Well, one of the questions I had, and I started asking this several years ago of, of friends of mine like, uh, uh, like Isaac Faber over at Stanford who worked with uh, Travis to do the R program on Metalogs. I said to Isaac, I said, well, if we do it this way, how different is that from if you just combine the new data and the prior data and do the linear regression on the whole data set. I mean, wouldn't that make sense? You take the new data, combine it with the prior data, and fit a metalog to the combined data. Wouldn't that make some kind of sense under some circumstances uh, to do that? And so I tried it. And if you take this data set, the, the, the old data, plus the new data, and you put them into a same set of sorted data, you fit a metalog to that you, using ordinary least squares. You end up with this set of uh, uh, quantile parameters, 10, 13, 18.1, which is exactly the same as these. We never knew that. And this is, this is, an, this is an astonishing, at least to me, result which is going through this whole system of updating equations per the Bayesian linear model, if you assume a data prior, is no different at all from combining the data and using the y transpose y to the minus y1. Right? This is the familiar ordinary least squares equation. So you can calculate your updated set of coefficients, the mean of them, uh, which determines the mean of your quantile parameters. You can calculate that either by going through the Bayesian linear model or simply by ordinary linear regression. And that is, you know, that's a bottom line headline, which, uh, which will be a headline uh, in the paper. It's, it's a completely new result so far as I know. And it actually applies to any use of the linear model. I'm surprised I haven't seen it anywhere in the annals of statistics. If you all know of a reference to it, uh, let me know. Well, Tom, explain the, the, the data prior here, though. So assuming the diffuse prior means that you're sort of assuming that all data points are equally as important to you? Yes, yes. It is the data prior, thank you, Sam. The data prior assumes that your, that your prior information can be expressed in terms of a set of data, like these orange points here. And that those, and that that set of data, from your perspective, is equally likely. So you can you can express your prior data in terms of a set of equally likely data. 
Now, how you come up with that data part, you can come up with it with any way at all. You, you can come up with it as an encoded, as, a, as an empirical data prior, the way I showed, or you can encode it in this way. You can come up with any, any other way so long as you're willing to say at the end of the day, this prior data in, in, includes, this, this data prior includes both my strength of information in terms of the number of data, the strength of that in terms of the number of data, as well as the shape and location information contained in the data itself. As long as you've got that, this method um, applies. And it's very simple. It's not, an, it's not a hard assumption to make if you start looking at uh, your past data sets. These could also be encoded from an expert, but you just come up with however, you basically have to come up with the, the answer to the question, how many data points do I, how many new data points do I need to have the same amount of information as what's contained in the old data set? But anyway, the, the main result here, the headline result, is you get the same result either way. And so you can use either method. But obviously, since the ordinary, since the ordinary least squares is so commonly used, everybody has a program that does that, you just combine the new data and the old data, put it into ordinary least squares, and now you have your metalog coefficients for uh, uh, updated uh, posterior distribution using Bayesian inference. Now I need to say one more thing before I get to the get to the final uh, conclusions of all this, and that is where do we get the covariance matrix from? I said that this lambda n here uh, is determined only by the number of data. Why is that? Uh, so you don't have to assess the covariance matrix. You don't have to come up with it arbitrarily. You don't have to ask ask experts for, for it. You don't have to come up with correlation coefficients. Why is that? Well, because your Y matrix depends on these observations, uh, depends on these, uh, these, these YIs, that is the, uh, the, the, the cumulative probability associated with each of your data points. That is I over N plus 1, and we can explain where that comes from. But that's what's typically used, and there are theoretical reasons for using that, um, uh, for assigning equally likely a probability equally likely data. That means this whole lambda N is only a function of N itself, the number. That means you can actually write out what is lambda for any value of N, and those are, this is for a three, uh, this is for a three term metalog, but it's a completely general relationship. There are no special cases. These numbers are the numbers. You'll notice that the number in the upper left hand corner of this lambda matrix is always equal to the number of data, and this is the number of, of uh, previous data plus, plus new data, and, uh, and that as a result of that, when you take this lambda to the minus one, that lambda to the minus one at least roughly is inversely proportional to this number, which is in the upper left-hand corner, and that means that your marginal variance is the quantile parameters decline roughly in, in proportion to 1 over n. This makes it, in effect, analogous to the central limit theorem that says the variance uh, declines as, uh, as a proportion of 1 over n, roughly. And, then, and, and that's how wide are your distributions over your quantile parameters after you're updating. And then finally, if one cares only about the mean of the coefficients and the quantile parameters, the prior data x is the only information you need because x has a number in it and that number determines this, which determines the covariance matrix. So really all you have to do is carry your data forward uh, as an empirical data prior or as, or as a, uh, uh, an encoded data prior and that's the only need you need to carry forward for subsequent Bayesian updating. So with these assumptions, basically Bayesian updating of metalog parameters is fast, simple, and closed form. You start off with your data prior. You've got some new data over here. You combine the new data with the prior data, run a, uh, run a metalog distribution through that using ordinary least squares. That gives you the updated posterior parameters. And now, and, and the proof of this, by the way, is far from trivial. Um, I can't tell you how much time I spent on this. Uh, with multiple colleagues, uh, but we finally proven that it does work out according to the matrix algebra, and, and that will be in the uh, unpublished manuscript. That brings us back to where we started, how Norman can now update his probability distribution as each new uh, sample of catching a new trout becomes available, and 
if you see, you'll notice that as you simulate from these, let's say these are all your new fish data, that's your started with your prior, you'll see that your quantile parameters will converge to those of the source distribution with the number of new data. And furthermore, and importantly, you'll see that the probability distribution, these are your probability distributions over your quantile parameters now. We, the, the orange ones are the prior. Um, as you get more and more new data, these distributions get narrower and narrower, as they should, because after 100 new data, you are actually highly certain of, or let's say there's a low degree of certain uncertainty as to where your quantile parameters will turn out uh, because you caught so many fish. And so, and so that's just what you would expect. And then uh, one more example here, I'm going to convert now to an example where I've used a nine-term uh, log metalog distribution. Um, and as you know from, uh, from my, uh, probably the, the first session here, we, we learned that in the, in the, uh, in the case of 3,474 uh, catch and release steelhead records for the Babine River, the distribution is actually bimodal uh, on the size of these fish. And uh, we also learned that when you fit those to a metalog distribution, you end up with a bimodal shape and that's quite stable under bootstrapping and other things. We know the shape is bimodal, but suppose you're a fish biologist, which, and you didn't know that, and most fish biologists, even as of today, don't know that. Um, and you started off with a prior distribution that was just, say, it was like a, a log normal distribution or a gamma distribution, something like that. Um, and that was your prior, and then you started sampling from the source distribution would you, using metalog Bayesian inference, would you recover something that has that shape? And the answer is, actually, yes, you would. Um, as from 100 new data, if, if this was your prior, and let's say you had an N0 of 100, if you had 100 new data, you've got something that begins to take on the shape of the source distribution. If you have 500 new data, it very closely takes on the shape of the source distribution. If you did 5,000, it would be closer yet. The parameters converge to the quantile parameters. And indeed, as you update your multivariate normal distribution over your prior distribution, you'll find that as you add more and more data, the posteriors end up converging uh, to your, uh, far, uh, to, to your uh, source quantile parameters. Uh, and ended up, but end up also reflecting uh, the strength of the prior information you had, whatever that is. So that that concludes the key uh, the key topics here. Uh, what I hope I've shown you is what what I feel is the is the holy grail in the sense that I think me and many others have wanted this forever, and we can now do it. Start with an any shape prior distribution of variable interest updated in closed form, in light of new data with Bayes' theorem, end up with an any shape posterior uh, that's of the same family as the prior. We think we've accomplished a previously unattained goal. We're doing it by the bookending that I've described where the inscrutable parameters of the traditional linear model become easily interpretable for both assessment of the prior interpretation and interpretation of the pro posterior. Calculations are in closed form according to Bayes' theorem and we're using the means to update. Uh, if, if you're only cared about the means, if you only care about updating the quantile parameters, then all you have to use is metalog regression, that is fiddling, fitting the uh, metalog distribution using ordinary least squares to the combined data. There are innumerable potential applications, uh, you know, quite apart from Lockheed Martin, uh, somebody contacted me about uh, time to failure of helicopter blades, and they were also a military contractor, and they were concerned about how to do updating on this. We can imagine, I've already started updating COVID-19 projections as daily new deaths are revealed uh, based on this method. You can, up, you can imagine uh, human clinical trials, updating uh, safety and efficacy, agriculture supply chains, Electric power, probabilistic projecting the output of solar power facilities as new information on weather becomes available. Uh, data science, including machine learning. Cybersecurity, this was Isaac Faber's uh, original uh, use of all this. So we don't know where it'll go. We're at the very, very beginning. It's just impossible to imagine uh, the applications. Um, 
at least <laughs> as one person. I think everybody needs to imagine imagine the applications you know in the in the in the domain in which they work, right? In the domain in which they're knowledgeable. 